Hello everyone. Uh, good day. Hope everyone can hear me right. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this uh, webinar. Uh, we, uh, the Canadian Journalism Society Young Professional Committee, initiated this new webinar series uh, targeting the uh, young professionals to enhance their knowledge in uh, engineering. Uh, this is the uh, inaugural webinar and we plan uh, for a monthly webinar depending on the speaker's availability. Uh, my name is Rajit Dayaratna. I am a geotechnical engineer at SECO, uh, one of the uh, leading R&D organization in Canada. We are based in St. John's, Newfoundland, but we do have offices in uh, Halifax and Ottawa. And I am serving the uh, CGS YP committee as the knowledge lead, and I will uh, moderate today's webinar. Uh, before we get started, uh, there are a few housekeeping notes. Uh, to avoid any uh, disturbance, I disable your audio and video. If you have any questions, uh, please type them in the chat box. Uh, presentation will take about uh, 40 to 45 minutes and there will be a short uh, Q&A session at the end. If you have any uh, questions for the speaker, please uh, type them in the chat box uh, and then I will take them as they appear. Also, uh, not that the, uh, as I mentioned before, the, this webinar will be recorded and shared with you later. Uh, before I introduce uh, today's speaker, I would like to hand over the floor to our chair of our um, CGS YP committee, Dr. Sharma Roy, to share a few words with you about our committee. Over to you, Sharma. Yeah, thanks, Rajit. And hi, everyone. As Rajit mentioned, my name is Sharma Roy, and I'm the inaugural and founding chair of the Canadian Geotechnical Society Young Professional Committee. So before we jump into the details, let's start with the safety moment. And the safety moment that I have for you today is the stretching at the workstation. As many of you like me uh, probably spend a lot of time in front of computers. So working at a computer involves very few changes in body position. This lack of movement can lead to muscle pains and strain. No matter how well a workstation is designed, we need to pay attention to how we work. So a few suggestions, take a micro break, stand up or stretch for each hour I spend at a workstation. Vary the work tags, break up keyboarding tags, work between the uh, between the jobs that doesn't necessarily need to sit uh, necessarily need you to sit in front of the computer. Try to stand up and relax your muscles. There are a few exercise tips on the right hand side, as you can see in the figure, that might be helpful. If you want to know more about these, there's a link behind this one. You can go and check. Um, now, the Young Professional Committee is a brand new committee established in late last year with a focus to bring together all the young professionals of our community in an organized forum. And by young professionals, we mean uh, those like many of you and me who has less than 10 years of experience. And our vision is very simple, building the next generation of geotechnical leaders. Based on that vision, our mission is supported by five pillars, network, knowledge, development, collaboration, and impact. The committee will provide a network for peers and veterans, create avenues for building geotechnical knowledge, provide access to both personal and professional development, create opportunities through collaboration with industry, academia, government, and other young professional groups outside CGS, and create an impact by articulating a vision for the future within the uh, changing industry landscape. As you can see, we have a diverse leadership team representing young professionals from industry, academia, including both professors and students. And just to give you a number, 77% of our current leadership team members are from industry and 23% from university. We have both men and, men and women, 45% men and 55% women, as you can see, and almost all provinces in Canada. So eight out of 10 provinces. So being said, there are still a few open positions in our team, uh, so we are looking for two folks um, from two provinces, New Brunswick and Quebec, and also three people from three territories, Northwest Territories, Yukon and Nunavut. Um, if you are an enthusiastic and active young geotechnical professional from these provinces or territories and interested to be a part of the leadership team, please reach out to me or Rajit or any of our leadership team members. We have taken some major initiatives with a few months of being formed. This year we have started a pilot CGS mentorship program and also this webinar series. A few other initiatives are also under planning and we will hear from us soon. Now the question would be like how you will get updated of the events that you're organizing. We have created a LinkedIn group for all the young professionals and we already have over 125 members 
So feel free to join the group. There's a lot of energy in that group, so you'll love it. And besides this, please follow the CGS LinkedIn page to get an update of the upcoming initiatives. Um, so whatever initiatives you're going to take, there will be a post uh, related to that from the CGS LinkedIn page. And also, if you haven't become a CGS member yet, this is the start of 2023 and probably the great time to become a member as there will be many benefits of becoming a member. Now with that, thanks for joining in and I will pass it to Rajiv to introduce our speaker. Uh, thanks, Shama. Uh, now it's time to welcome our speaker today. Uh, we have a well-known uh, geotechnical engineer and researcher with us, uh, Dr. Lucas Aronson. Uh, he's a principal geotechnical engineer at BGC Engineering with 18 years of expertise in uh, permafrost engineering, uh, specifically in uh, frozen soil mechanics, periglacial risk assessment, and geothermal modeling. He's the uh, past president of the uh, Canadian Permafrost Association and currently the uh, chair of the uh, 2024 International Permafrost Conference to be held in uh, Whitehorse, uh, Yucca territories. He received his uh, PhD in civil engineering at uh, ETH uh, Zurich, Switzerland in 2002. In 2003, he moved to Edmonton, Alberta to spend four years at the uh, University of Alberta Geotechnical Center. Lucas has uh, worked on in infrastructure and mining projects in the Arctic and mountain permafrost and on the stability of frozen slopes in the uh, European Alps, the South American Andes and Asia. He has been involved in consulting and research work related to preventing permafrost degradation, re-establishing uh, pre-construction thermal regimes after constructions, accelerating the consolidation time uh, consolidation of uh, mine waste tailings and cold climate heap leaching. He has studied the uh, effects of climate change on uh, northern transportation infrastructure as part of uh, various uh, projects, including climate uh, change vulnerability assessments. Lucas uh, teaches permafrost engineering courses at universities and for industry and uh, published various scientific uh, publications in the fields of uh, frozen soil mechanics, permafrost engineering, uh, rock glaciers, and glaciology. Lucas is an adjunct uh, professor at the Civil Engineering Department of the University of Manitoba. He was the uh, recipient of the uh, Troy L. Pugh Award in 2003 and was awarded the uh, Roger J. E. Brown Memorial Award uh, from the Canadian Geotechnical Society in uh, 2010 and 2022 for co-authoring an outstanding publication and his contribution to permafrost engineering research and to the Coal uh, Regions Engineering Division. Um, so without further ado, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Aronson to deliver his talk on uh, Coal Regions Engineering. Over to you, Lucas. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Perfect. And I hope you can see the screen. Yes, and I can. Yep. Let's get started. Perfect. Yeah, so I'm also trying. So for the audience, so first, yeah, thank you for the invitation. And it's an honor to, to start the webinar. I think it's a great idea. And it's, I mean, we have the opportunities to reach out to our young um, professionals. And I think it's it's a great initiative um to have this webinar series and that's why i'm really honored that you reached out to me to give that first um webinar today um i try to keep an eye on the chat as much as i can so that's why you probably see me watching to the second screen over there so if you have questions um yeah feel free to put them into the chat and if i can i'll try to respond Immediately, if not, well, yeah, well, we'll just keep it to, to the end and I hope we'll have some some time at the end of this uh, presentation. So. Permafrost engineering 101, the idea of this presentation is is really to give you a very brief introduction about permafrost engineering. And as I've mentioned before, there's not going to be an equation and we're not going into uh, too many details uh, of permafrost engineering or thaw consolidation and all that. But it, I want to give you an understanding of why dealing and working in this cold environment is slightly different. Um, I can actually skip over this slide. Um, I've already been, been introduced. So 
I've been with BGC since 2007, um, 15 years working as a consultant, but also uh, still being involved in research um, related to permafrost engineering. Now, what is so different when we talk about cold regions? First of all, that the mechanical behavior of ground ice is highly nonlinear, and it is time and temperature dependent because the ice is a viscous material that behaves differently at different temperatures and temperatures, and the state of the soil also changes. Then climate change is affecting the cold regions more than other regions. So Canada as a whole is seeing significantly more impact of climate change than if you just look at the global average. But then if you go into the Arctic, you see even more extreme changes. So when we're looking at designing anything related to uh, a permafrost environment, so in other words, in the high Arctic, we really can no longer depend on the past in order to answer the question, how is it going to behave in the future? And yes, we talk about permafrost engineering, but it's also cold regions engineering. So a lot of the aspects I'm going to talk about are not just limited to an area where you have permafrost, and we'll get into what actually permafrost is, but it's also just generally in terms of cold regions where freeze thaw and the presence of ground ice being it just for several months or for decades impacts the, um, the strength and the material properties of your foundation. Now, let's start with what is permafrost. And if we're defining permafrost, and we're going back to the original definition by Mahler from 1947, then he says that soil or rock with or without included water that has remained at or below zero degree centigrade for two or more years. So what it does is, it's a time and a temperature definition. It doesn't say anything about the type of the soil. So it's a state. It is whether it's frozen or unfrozen, and it needs to be there for two or more years. But it does not say if it has actually ground ice in it. And that's important because permafrost is not equal to permafrost. If you have bedrock in permafrost, that's the same from a mechanical perspective than bedrock in a non-permafrost environment. However, if you have ice-rich glacier marine deposits, if you thaw those, then the behavior obviously becomes very different. So only because you have permafrost doesn't tell you what is important for you as a geotechnical engineer, but it's the composition and what type of soil do you have, how much ground ice you have, and so on. Another very important graph that I want to show here is the ground temperature regime. If you understand this graph, you already know probably 90% of what's important about permafrost. And that is, first of all, permafrost does not come to the surface because what we have is the so-called active layer. And the active layer is the layer that freezes in the winter and thaws back in the summer. So even in the high Arctic, actually summers can be quite warm. So you do have that layer that thaws. And if we go back to the definition where the ground must stay at or below zero centigrade for two consecutive years or more, then we no longer have permafrost, obviously, as defined in this upper layer. So if we were to measure ground temperatures at depth for a whole year and then check at every depth what is the minimum and maximum temperature, you get this what we call the trumpet curve. And the active layer during the summer, we get positive temperatures. So at the ground surface, it's the warmest. And then as you go deeper, the maximum temperatures that were measured over a period of one year decreases until you reach a point where the maximum temperature has never been above zero degree. 
And that is now your permafrost table. So at that point, that's where the permafrost starts. Whereas then the upper part in the winter, yes, it's get, it gets very cold. And as you go deeper, the coldest temperatures are actually increasing or getting warmer. But this is the active layer, and now we're getting into the permafrost. The temperatures at depth generally increase. So as you probably know, where it's the core of the, the Earth is, is, is very warm. That's why you have a geothermal gradient coming from the bottom. So as you go deeper and deeper, the ground temperatures increase. And they increase to a point where they cross the zero degree line again. And that's your permafrost base. So below that, it's above zero degree. So now you have um, your boundaries of your permafrost. You have the top, the permafrost table, and the bottom, your permafrost base. And that's the thickness of the permafrost. And then another important point is this depth of zero annual amplitude. And what that is, is that at some depth, the seasonality is no longer visible. So at the, you can imagine at the top surface, you have hot summers, cold winters, and that amplitude decreases with depth until you reach a point where you actually no longer see the influence from the season. So at that depth or below that depth, then the temperatures remain in essence constant. Now we have climate change, global warming, so we do see actually some warming there, but we'll get to that. But typically you would not see changes in temperature, specifically not on an annual basis at this depth. So that's just the basis and understanding this trumpet curve and the top of the permafrost, the base of the permafrost and the active layer is really the key of understanding the behavior of permafrost. Another important aspect is how long ground can remain frozen. So if we're looking at all the elements of the cryosphere, like snow, river ice, sea ice, glacier ice, you'll note that frozen ground can actually remain frozen or stay frozen from days up to millennia. And that's all called frozen ground. So we have very old permafrost, but also more younger and obviously then in other areas further south, we have seasonally frozen ground. So when we have just for days, which can happen here in Vancouver, occasionally we have a, a day where the grounds are below zero degrees. And then if you go into the interior, so if you go, if, if you go uh, to places like Alberta, Saskatchewan, you have for a month, you can have some frozen ground and then you go into get into the permafrost. But ground can remain frozen for very different um, length. And when we talk permafrost at areas, we have some of uh, millennia range. And you may have heard of these founds of mammoths or other animals within permafrost. So here, this was a very famous mammoth that was found in 1977 in Russia, in Siberia, and it was dated back to 40,000 years. Now, in Canada, uh, more recently, there were actually also uh, very interesting founds. So this is Zur. This was um, a wolf pup. And this one was found in 2016 near Dawson City uh, in, in the Yukon. And this was dated back to 57,000 years old. So that um, mummy, mummified wolf pup was frozen within permafrost for nearly 60,000 years. So we know that the ground there stayed frozen for such a long time. And just last year, Nunchaga was found, that's another mammoth a baby, and that was also found in a placer mine near Dawson City, and that was found last June. Uh, I haven't heard that it's been dated yet. Uh, I think they're um, uh, the dating is, is on its way, but it's probably going to be in the same uh, 50, 60,000 year range that I would assume this uh, mammoth uh, is old. So where do we find permafrost? When we look at Canada, it lies about 50%. And we have two distinct zones. And we'll see that in a map in a second. Between 
continuous and discontinuous permafrost. Those are the two major zones that we differentiate with. And it can be found in northern regions as well as at higher elevations. So the higher you go, the colder it gets, and that's when you can get into permafrost again. Now, I talked about the active layer, and it's from some decimeter or centimeter stick to it could be several meters. So the warmer you get during the summer and the longer your summers are, the thicker this active layer becomes. So in the high Arctic, it's just let's say 0 0.2, 0 0.3 meters. But then as you go further south, this active layer becomes thicker. And I've also mentioned in permafrost table, a very important aspect because that's the base of the active layer. And then we also have something called talic, and that's a non-frozen body within a permafrost environment, often related to some groundwater fluxes or other water that's circulating through the permafrost and keeps it from freezing because the water is flowing. So this is uh, a global permafrost distribution map. And if you're not so familiar with this type of looking at the map, so we're looking at actually at the North Pole here, North America is to the right. And here we have Russia. Um, this is the uh, China, the Tibetan Plateau. So here in this area, it's the elevation that is driving the presence of, uh, of permafrost, whereas uh, around the Arctic, it's the latitude, so we got North America and then uh, Siberia. And you can see the permafrost extent, so what we call the continuous and then the discontinuous sporadic isolated permafrost. If we're just zooming in into Canada, you will see here that the continuous permafrost, this is this darker blue, and as we go further south, it goes into discontinuous and sporadic permafrost. And you'll also note that the Western Arctic is warmer than the Eastern Arctic. So in the East, we find permafrost uh, at lower altitudes and typically also colder, and that's uh, based on the jet stream and just the, the general movement of air masses that are uh, in the Pacific. We have the warmer air masses that go up across the pole and then coming down on the eastern Arctic. And we've seen obviously some of those changes in these jet streams um, that now suddenly reach even further south in the east, having these cold storms in the eastern, uh, in eastern North America in general. But you'll see this influence of the jet stream here also and the moving air masses in the permafrost distribution map that the Western Arctic is typically warmer than the Eastern Arctic. However, when it comes to ground ice, it's not the same story necessarily. So in the Western Arctic, we actually have more ground ice compared to the Eastern Arctic. So in the Eastern Arctic, we have more bedrock uh, at the surface, whereas in the Western Arctic, where we have the big delta, the, the McKinsey Delta, for example, that allows the soil to generate to, to um, build ground ice, we do have actually more ground ice. So from an engineering and geotechnical perspective, we're actually more concerned, if you wish, about the ground ice and not necessarily at the permafrost. So the working in the Western Arctic, even though we probably have warmer and less permafrost, is different than working in the Eastern Arctic just because of the nature of the permafrost when it comes to ground ice. And what's happening with ground ice has uh, is shown here specifically when it thaws and the differences in ground ice um, by Rand O'Neill in a very simple animation. And you see three different soils exposed to exactly the same temperatures. But on the left, this one had a lot of ground ice compared to um, the one on the right, the sample on the right, which has very little ground ice. So depending on how much ground ice you have, your soil is responding very differently to changes in temperatures. So when you do your site investigation, you must make sure to understand how much ground ice do you have 
because that dictates uh, your type of foundation as well as how your foundation reacts in response to warming. Now, going back to permafrost and where we can find it, it's also vertically very different. As you can imagine, in the high Arctic, uh, and let's take uh, Raglan in northern Quebec, uh, cold Arctic, we have about five to 600 meter thick permafrost. Whereas if you then go into this discontinuous sporadic areas, let's say Hay River in the Northwest Territories, we're actually having from zero to maybe 10 meters thick permafrost. So we're, it's, it's very shallow and it's also spatially very heterogeneous. So that's the whole range again. So if you're just in a permafrost environment, you don't necessarily know how thick your permafrost is. And if we were to cut now from the high Arctic down to the south, then you would look, it would, the permafrost distribution would look something like this. So at the high Arctic, we have permafrost and it's, that's why it's called continuous because you pretty much can go wherever you want and you find permafrost except for some talics. But then as you go further south, you have no longer permafrost everywhere. And that's why we call it the discontinuous. And then you go into the sporadic zone. And parallel to that, the active layer is increasing in thickness. The high Arctic, yeah, we have less than a meter for sure. But then as you go into this discontinuous and sporadic zone, that's when we saw seeing active layers of more than a meter and even several meters thick in the sporadic permafrost zone. So that zone that freezes and thaws, which is important for foundation design, changes dramatically as you go further south as well. Looking at um, what's climate change doing to permafrost conditions, so here's um, two resources that I picked. So one is from Smith et al. in uh, 2022, shows more of a global distribution. And we see in the cold Arctic, we see warming trends and we see war um, warming in the warmer Arctic and subarctic. Now, what you need to keep in mind here is that the y-axis on the B on this graph on the right is only three degrees, whereas the y-axis on the left graph is 11 degrees. So the warming in the cold Arctic is, in terms of temperatures, much more than we see the warming in the warm Arctic. We see a little bit of a similar trend here. Um, these are ground temperatures data from the Alps in an alpine environment. Um, I picked uh, Permos, which is, is from the Swiss Alps because they have very long data records. And we see something similar that uh, on the left we see 10 meter depth and the right 20 meter depth. But let's focus on the 20 meter depth. We see less warming in this warmer condition versus the colder condition. And the reason behind that is the latent heat. And the latent heat comes in when you thaw ice. So in areas where we have ground ice, the warming itself, when the temperatures are getting close to zero degree, doesn't really happen because the energy is used to melt the ice. So you, what you're seeing here in these warm conditions is you're seeing a slow thawing of the ground ice. And thawing and melting of ice takes a lot of energy. So the energy is used not to increase the temperature, but to change the phase. Whereas in the cold Arctic, so when you go from minus nine to minus six, you're not changing the phase, you're just changing the temperature. And that requires, or with the same energy, you wouldn't see similar changes in temperatures if you're already very close to zero degree because the energy is used to now uh, thaw the ice. So we're, what we're noting is a warming in the cold Arctic and a, slowly cha a slow change in the phase, so increase in unfrozen water in the warm Arctic. So where does it go? Uh, it's, it's a very difficult question. I mean, we know it's going in one direction, that it's warming, but we also know 
that it's developing more of these talix, thicker active layers. So this zone of unfrozen zone or very uh, uh, ice poor zone with a lot of water, that zone will increase. The high Arctic is just getting warmer, but we're seeing in these warmer discontinuous zones, we're, gonna not, we're not gonna see a permafrost disappearing very quickly, but we do see the near surface permafrost to thaw thicker active layer, more unfrozen water, changing the condition for us geotechnical engineers. In mountainous environment, um, what's important there is that we actually do have different permafrost depending on north or south facing. Um, we've seen already this uh, sketch here, and I just realized I need to speed up a little bit. Um, and so again, if we're going in the high Arctic, we have here continuous permafrost, very thick. And if we go to further south, we have discontinuous sporadic permafrost. And that's how it looks, the high Arctic, lots of water actually in, in the summer, uh, no trees, and a lot of these water bodies that can create these smaller or larger talix. But typically we have permafrost everywhere. But we also do see these ice wedges, uh, and we're not going into the details in terms of how they're formed, but ground ice can have very different forms. So you can have these ice wedges and you can have areas that have less ground ice and you can imagine when you thaw it uh, this will react very differently to uh, settlements so areas where we have a lot of ground ice will create cavities whereas areas that have very little ground ice may just settle a little bit and these wedges this is uh, some yedoma what we call it in, in alaska or siberia can be very thick so you see here two people as a scale so these these massive ice wedges can uh, be significant they may even be found within uh, bedrock so you, it's not, it doesn't mean that if you have bedrock that you have dry permafrost per se but you can act, actually have massive ground ice even within bedrock and when you then look at from the top you see these polygonal grounds and what those are is, in essence, you have these ice wedges along those polygons. So this is a very typical image from the high Arctic. If we're building our roads, and this is, this is not a finished road, so I'm not going to blame any engineer. This is just a, a, a first layer. But it, independently, you actually can see that those polygons may be visible through your structure. So you can have your, your, your road or if, if it's a pipeline or even a building within these polygonal grounds, then they will become visible if you're not um, designing and building accordingly within your structure as well. Now, another interesting phenomenon is that you can actually create some zero effect stress conditions. We see here that was just a very small ground disturbance. But the problem is if you have ice rich conditions within a continuous permafrost environment, you often have a very thick vegetation layer on the top. You have permafrost at the bottom. So when you disturb that permafrost near the surface, you thaw it for whatever reason, the water can't get away. So the water cannot go down because it's frozen. So it's a barrier. It can't go up because of that thick vegetation layer. So you're actually creating this excess water near the surface, which can also impact your foundation. Another interesting phenomenon in the high Arctic are pingos. And those are ice rich hills, if you wish. So they have been growing out of a drained lake originally, but it's in essence ice rich material. So underneath here, if you were to drill through this pingo, you would have completely ice filled core. So there's lots of ground ice in it. And if that were to thaw, um, so let's say you're building a pipeline or, or whatever over this, 
because you're, you're ignoring that um, there's ground ice in it and it were to thaw, you will see some major settlement because this is in essence uh, pure ice under this vegetation cover. Now, if we're jumping south into the discontinuous area, then we'll find permafrost mainly in areas that are protected by plateaus and peat and, uh, and trees. So you're only going to find permafrost in areas that had some sort of a thermal protection at the surface. So when you have these ponds and waters off in a heat sink, you can probably confidentially say that, yeah, there's not much of settlement below. But if you're at these higher elevated plateaus, there is a good chance that you actually do have uh, permafrost in there. So it's very challenging then to identify where exactly and how does it horizontally and vertically extend in these terrains. But typical surface expressions are these trunken trees. So when you see these trees bending in all different directions, that's a good indicator that there's probably permafrost not that far. And that is because when you have these higher elevated plateaus and you see the permafrost degrading, then the trees on the one side, they will fall in this direction, whereas on this side, they fall in the other direction. So the, the, the trees are not leaning because of wind or of a mass movement, but because the ground is uh, sinking unevenly. Same with thermocarst. Uh, thermocarst is an implication of the thawing of the ground ice below and then creating these uh, lakes or holes. So if you see an environment like this, there's a good chance that permafrost and some ground ice may still be around. Now, when it comes to infrastructure and building in these areas, it's important to understand how some of those processes work. And that's why I'm so focusing in this introduction to permafrost engineering on the land processes. So, so you want to know where your ice is, how your mass is are moving. So for example, if you have these thaw slumps here, this is a so-called retrogressive thaw slump, then you have you must understand that there's ice rich conditions probably everywhere along here. Here you have a road. And we also know that it's very difficult to stop these thaw slumps from going further back. So if you have a road here you and you see these thaw slumps forming, you do have some time, but eventually it will reach the road. Or here's another example. We have the same retrogressive thaw slump, but this time it is near the Demster Highway upstream. So you see the road here and with this camera, you see this the material goozing out from this retrogressive thaw slump. So eventually, that thaw slump is getting bigger and bigger, and there is a risk of this material reaching the road. So if it keeps flowing down to your infrastructure, it may impact the road eventually. And we're not only seeing these retrogressive thaw slumps in warm areas, but Tony Lefkovich in 2019 with his colleagues presented a nice paper showing that these shallow movements and failures, mass movements, started to become more frequent even in the high Arctic. So we do definitely see a change even in the high Arctic in continuous permafrost. So we must start to pay attention to some of those processes. Here you see another video, a time lapse of how these retrogressive thaw slumps form. And you can see it's really the active layer and the base of the permafrost that's thawing and then the active layer continuously fails and then because the water cannot drain you have this permafrost table as an impervious layer it just keeps sliding on top of it and stopping such a retrogressive thaw slump is extremely difficult and as shown here by this drone video from the northwest territories geological survey the extent and the impact such thaw slumps can have are far reaching. So we just see in a second, we see how much downslope impact this can have. And it has 
sediment transport, it impacts streams, but it can also impact your infrastructure that may be um, further downslope of some of those elements. Another mega slump um, is this very famous Badagaika crater in Siberia. And now these are huge dimensions. So this uh, width here is about 800 meter, and I think it's about 150 or so meter thick. So these phenomenons that we start to see more and more frequently develop within the Arctic environment can have dimensions that are significant and must be considered uh, in, um, in the design and alignment, for example, of our infrastructure. Another uh, smaller and probably less known phenomena are some methane crater blowouts. I'm not familiar with any case in North America, but that doesn't mean that they don't, don't exist. However, in Siberia and Russia, they have been documented blowouts of this methane crater. And it seems that methane starts to form uh, in response to some degradation at depth, but because the ground is also getting warmer, the strength decreases and now this bubble can then explode and create these blowouts. So this particular crater here has a diameter of 25 meter. And if infrastructure is nearby, this can obviously be a risk. Um, finally, another phenomenon, these are some creeping slopes. These are frozen debris lobes in the Brooks Range in, in Alaska. And you can probably see those lobated features. So here's one, you can see some over there. And this is the Dalton Highway. And we also have the Trans-Alaska Pipeline below. So these are two very sensitive and important types of infrastructure for, for Alaska. And you're having this slope, it's ice rich material and ice as viscous. So it creeps slowly downhill. And as you can see here in this 2019 image, it started to impact the road. Now, what it need to be done is that as an engineer, it wasn't possible to stop this frozen debris lobe from creeping because you have such a big mass. However, there's also little risk that it uh, slides catastrophically. So for this um, particular case, the, uh, the DOT decided that they're just going to divert the road around it. So that's going to save um, some time and to see what, what's happening with, with this frozen debris lobe over time. So the pipeline, which is, is here, is currently still safe. And monitoring is a key to understand uh, how this frozen debris lobe is going to behave in the future. Okay. I'm actually going to skip over this because I just want to touch a little bit on some infrastructure. Now, when it comes to infrastructure, and we're focusing again on Canada, there is not a lot of infrastructure actually. Oop, sorry in the Arctic. So when we look at the road network, we see that most of the roads are actually outside the uh, permafrost zone. However, there are some roads uh, in, in the Yukon as well as in the Northwest Territories. Probably more important when it comes to transportation infrastructure are aerodromes. So we have several uh, airports and it's key for Northern communities to be connected is to air travel. So we're seeing uh, mostly gravel runways. So the yellow dots are gravel runways, but there are a few asphalt runways such as um, in Inuvik, I'm um, not sure why it's so sensitive, in Inuvik or in Iqaluit. Uh, White Horse, uh, Yellowknife, for example, have asphalt runways. So when we're building roads or general infrastructure, we're trying to protect the permafrost as much as possible. So that's why when you see roads, often it is a fill and not a cut. So we're trying to avoid cutting into the permafrost environment as much as possible to keep the permafrost stable. And, but there are also problems when you're building on top of permafrost. So let's say you're building, you have your original ground surface, you're building your road in the winter, it's all good. 
But after the construction in the summer, what may happen is that you're increasing water accumulation and you, you change the vegetation there in the corner because you're using different material, you strip the vegetation, and suddenly you're getting deeper active layers in this toe of your embankment and that then creates settlements and it creates the crack. You have typical shoulder rotation or spreading of your road. So having these vertical cracks within the road is very typical. So when we look at these cracks along roads, that's a typical uh, sign of your shoulders settling. But we can also have other problems within Arctic environment. Let's say you have your ice wedge and your ice wedge thaws, then you can create sinkholes. Same here, differential settlements, very typical within a permafrost environment. Or coastal erosion, where your permafrost starts to thaw away near the coastline, impacting your infrastructure. So one way to um, prevent this from happening is you're building, you free, you keep your ground, uh, ground frozen using measures such as thermal siphons. So without going into details about what a thermal siphon is, but it's an active way of keeping the ground frozen. And in the notes, you do have this little schematic that uh, gives you a little bit of an overview of how thermal siphons work. And they've been out there for a long time. For example, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline is using those thermal siphons to keep the foundation uh, frozen. So with, with very success, with a big success, so the pipeline is above ground and with the thermal siphons, you're preventing any disturbance to the ground so that the pipeline can actually be stable. More recently, uh, thermal piles have been introduced uh, in Canada. This is a building in um, uh, Inuvik, and they are, are using thermal piles here to keep the foundation frozen. I also want to very briefly show you this video of a building in Austria where the, in order to prevent the building from being destroyed, they're using a more creative way of foundation. So it's been recognized that the ground is moving, but if you're just using three points as your foundation, your building can actually move. If you had four points then and one corner settles, you're creating stresses in your foundation that results in a crack. However, if you're using only three points, then one point may settle, deform, but you're allowing it by being creative to jack it up every year and add another steel plates or just adjust how much it settled. Because it, initially you do not know how much settlement you got, but over time by monitoring, you can adjust them. And I'm just gonna see in a second, there you see here how they then measure how much they need to move up the building. So you just bring, you, bring your presses, move it and insert another steel plate to adjust your foundation. So wrapping things slowly up is air temperatures are increasing. We know that changes in precipitation, permafrost is degrading, resources are limited, connectivity is poor, and we need to work with it. Now, yeah, just citing Donald Rumsfeld, there's no knowns, but more criticality unknown unknown, specifically when it comes to climate change. So how do we address those? So first of all, recognizing that we cannot address all uncertainties. So we, we don't know them, specifically when it comes to long design lives, but with, we can manage those risks and we may accept that we cannot protect the permafrost, but maybe we have to allow permafrost to thaw. Maybe we can do a pre-thaw and monitoring and adaptation as I've shown in this, uh, in this example, is a way of how to deal with these uncertainties in the future. And the fact that infrastructure is at risk has also been recently shown by Jorten et al, that there's a lot of um, hazard potential here in the high Arctic. And mainly when you look at this map critically in this discontinuous zone, so this is in, in, in Russia or here in, in North America, in these warm, 
discontinuous ice-rich zones. So that's where we have higher risks and that's where we have the major changes that are going to happen in impacting the infrastructure. So we need to address active layer thickening, coastal erosion, changes in flooding, new mass movements, changes in hydrology. So those changes need to be addressed. And getting to my last slide here, how do we address them? First of all, we can do this. So geotechnical designs, and they, yes, they're challenging, but there are tools out there. So only because there are so many uncertainties, walking away is definitely not a solution. We have to be creative, but there are tools out there. And it's important to understand the systems and how the environment is working. And that's why this introduction is really focusing on understanding the landscape, understanding where the ground ice is, understanding how the movements are and how to feel what the future may bring. Try to minimize the thermal and mechanical disturbance. That's always the best way to do. Keep the nature, keep it the way it is and let it go and monitoring and understanding the processes specifically because we can no longer rely on the past, on the past to tell us what happens in the future. There's some fancy numerical models out there they're tools that are available to us engineers, so we should use them. And they're becoming more and more powerful, like 3D thermal modeling is an option and it's becoming more uh, frequently used also in industry and not just in research. And design for uh, potential future conditions. So this adaptive design, because we cannot design for all uh, scenarios, because the range in the results is just too big but we can adapt to it and we can plan our design to do that and use a systematic approach in order to address climate change. Uh, there are tools out there like the PIVC protocol to address changes from climate change in a systematic way. Yes, and that's the end. And I'm sorry that I was maybe a little bit too long, 